What's up, my ninjas? I am Strident, and I am back with my Man of Steel movie review. Finally, this is like the fourth time I'm trying to do this, and it just, the first time somehow my video got corrupt, I don't know, or corrupted, and uh, I have no idea what it was, and I, I'm thinking it was probably because I was using uh, my older iMovie instead of the newer iMovie that I'm using now. But anyway, long story short, me and my homeboy, uh, brother from another mother, Agent O, went and saw this opening weekend. We loved it. I was pretty blown away considering that it had everything, in my opinion, that the, the other Superman movies since Superman 2 had been missing. Um, right off the bat, you already heard what I had to say to all the haters and whatnot, and I have to still say, you know, Fans of Christopher Reeve as Superman, are, and, and if that's your only frame of reference, you're going to have lots of issues with this Superman because Christopher Reeve, he is not. He does do a good job, though, keeping uh, most of the things that we know as Superman, as far as how Superman acts, how he carries himself, most of that is intact. Um, this is a new, uh, what's the word, reimagining in a sense, because many things, like I said, that are already Superman are here, but there are some new things and new angles and new, you know, ideas added to the mix to make it a little bit more, uh, I don't know, relatable to today's audiences. And I shouldn't even say relatable, understandable for today's audiences and uh, up to date. You know what I mean? Because there are a lot of things that in Superman's, what, 80 plus year history, um, there, there are a lot of things that have be, become classic Superman that don't really fit in today's society. So um, they don't even fit with today's, uh, uh, you know, ideas of heroism and, you know, just fantasy in general. So there's little tweaks in those departments. And I don't have a problem with the tweaks that they made. Uh, the story pretty much, it takes you from... Superman's birth or Kal-El's birth to the the death of uh, of Krypton and I need to tell you guys ahead of time as if you don't know this my reviews have spoilers unless I try not to and I let you know ahead of time this is a spoiler filled review so don't go any further if you don't want me to spoil the movie for you but by now if you're one of my ninjas you've seen it or you at least know what you're about to see when you do go see it you see the the death of Krypton before you see the actual death of Krypton, you're introduced to Jarrell and the Council and Zod and Feora and uh, Lara, Superman's uh, or Kal-el's mom and Jarrell's wife. Um, you, you understand the the history between Jarrell and uh, 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 Zod. They used to be friends, but now they're, they're having issues, and Zod is a little power hungry, and he's trying to kind of get his point across by using his military status because he wants to protect his people. He wants to get them off the planet. He wants to cut out the middleman with all this bullshit talking and thinking and you know, let's let let's deliberate for hours and hours while the planet is in peril and he's just like I'm going to cut down all you assholes who don't know what you're talking about and I'm going to take control. Jarrell doesn't agree. Fight ensues, action, all kinds of cool stuff and and I have to say the beginning of this movie is amazing. The movie is amazing too, but the beginning is amazing because it made you feel like you were really on another world. There were little things that I mean you've seen before, but it's 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 an alien world and there's action going on on it. You're seeing kind of an insurrection as well as, you know, the the how do I say like the the introduction to the last days of this planet. So uh, it takes cues actually from Superman the animated series, which is pretty nice. The whole uh, Jarrell speaking to the council and trying to get them to understand. I mean, these things were in the comics, but the way that it was done felt very reminiscent of uh, the animated series. Anyway, uh, Zod kills Jarrell, and I thought that was actually kind of cool because at first he just seems like he's kind of assertive, overly so. <laughs> then you get to see Jarrell go GI Joe on. A bunch of Kryptonians, and then him and and uh, Zod fight, and he actually beats Zod. 
for a brief moment, you know? He's fighting for the life of his son and for his wife, but mostly his son because he knows the son will be the, uh, he carries Krypton's legacy. And uh, Zod gets the upper hand and kills him shortly after that. Uh, then you see uh, the, or you're shown the council dealing with Zod and Feora and his cohorts. And uh, they're sent to the Phantom Zone, which was nice to hear the Phantom Zone, so you know not everything has been changed. Just as they get sent away, Krypton blows up. It's done. Uh, not before Kalel is sent rocketing off to Earth. Um, it was nice that they did things in the way that they did. You know, you were introduced to Krypton in the middle of a little uh, kind of a coup. Then you see Jarrell doing his thing. You see uh, the battle between him and uh, uh, Zod. You're introduced to the birthing matrix or the Genesis matrix that uh, creates all the kids on Krypton. So I guess they can just do whatever they want as far as humping goes. Um, but every kid, every every person or being born on Krypton is born with a predetermined role in their society, which is like holy eugenics batman <laughs> you know it's ridiculous i was like damn they have a very specific predetermined role to play um you're you're explained or or introduced i'm sorry to this piece this artifact called the codex the kryptonian codex which holds the the dna of all these predetermined classes Jarrell steals that Somehow he managed to break it down and feed all that into his baby, Kal-El, Kal who will become Superman. So, off the bat, you're shown that not only is Superman, they explain about the yellow sun, because you see that Krypton on this planet is really harsh, or in this version, I'm sorry, is really harsh. The atmosphere is really harsh. It, it looks almost like a prehistoric planet. I mean, everything is real Geiger-esque. Agent O mentioned that in the previous take, but... uh it's real Geiger-esque. Everything looks so organic and really thick and strong. And uh, I don't know. It's this weird, uh, uh, like, prehistoric quality to the, the, the environments on Krypton. And there's a really cloudy, muddy-looking sky. And they explain that their sun is so much older than our sun. So it's burnt. It's, it's on its way out. It's partially, you know, adding to the, the destruction of Krypton. Um, so when, when Kal-El gets to Earth, his muscles and cells and everything will drink up the radiation like, like crazy because it, our sun is newer. Um, so it's kind of cool that uh, that's where they're going with, you know, the explanation with this. Because, you know, back in the day, the explanation was just that yellow sun, yellow sunlight has a different effect on him. And you've seen so many interpretations of this. And it's been kind of, some of them were hokey and some of them made sense. Most of them kind of just didn't really have the explanation. But on top of that, you have the Codex that gave him, I'm talking thousands of different uh, abilities or DNA strands to, to make him way more powerful than the average warrior, the average strategist, the average scientist. It's like his potential is limitless. So for those of you who didn't understand why he could be Zod, which I'll get to, here is in the beginning of the movie, here is your answer to the end of the movie. Anyway, back on track, we are shown Earth, and you see uh, Clark Kent is now in his uh, deadliest catch mode with his big old beard, and you know he's on a fishing boat doing what he's doing, uh, kind of being clumsy, so to speak. People are helping him out. He just kind of looks kind of like he doesn't give a shit. He doesn't know what's what's really going on. But you're treated to him saving someone a bunch of people are trapped on an oil rig and uh or a platform i'm sorry and it's like about to it's ex it's like on fire and it's blowing up pieces are falling apart and stuff and it's the part you see from the trailer where he's running around shirt and stuff all burnt off and he's he catches a big piece of it to hold it off so that the coast guard can get the survivors out and then you're, that's your first superman-esque moment in the film uh, one thing I have to say too and I didn't mention this with the Krypton scenes but 
all of the set design, costumes, everything, special effects, everything is so well done in this film that it's, it's amazing. And it all adds to the atmosphere and the feel of the movie. And you don't feel like you're watching a guy in tights do random shit. You never feel like that. It always feels like this is very alien. This is very sci-fi. This is very whatever. And even in Kansas, in the, the Smallville parts, it feels like it really is some small town in some part of the Midwest. You know what I'm saying? Which is awesome because that's what it's supposed to be. Anyway... You see Superman throughout the, the course of the, mi the middle portion of the film doing these different jobs because he kind of drifts from town to town, hiding his identity, kind of trying to figure out where he would fit. These scenes are also intercut with uh, flashbacks to when he was a child growing up in Smallville and you know all the little things he dealt with having powers and not knowing when he was supposed to use them and you know not being able to do the things that other kids can do you know he can't get in a fight with with any kid that's picking on him because he knows that if he punches that kid he could destroy him um he can't use his speed and strength playing sports or anything like that because he's so much more powerful than everyone else and these are the things that we've been we've touched these in other films you know even in animated series and you kind of get to see how he deals with it and then you also get to see how other people deal with the fact that they've seen some of these kids grew up uh, you know dealing with the fact that they saw Clark Kent do some amazing things and their parents react to it like it's some kind of guardian angel or it's 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 an act of God and shit like that you know so you get to kind of see the appropriate reactions to these insanely superhuman feats that young Clark Kent was pulling off and I thought that was awesome you are treated to uh, another take on Ma and Pa Kent which I thought were awesome it was uh, Kevin Costner and Diane Lane. They did an awesome job. And uh, they felt like people, like I live in the Midwest now. And I've lived in about two places in the Midwest, I'll say. But I've traveled throughout the Midwest a lot over the years that I've been here. And I've met people like them. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know if they would do some of the stuff that you know, you'll see in the film as far as the extreme situations like Pa Kent and the tornado, but um, as far as just their mannerisms and the way they spoke and you know the attitudes are real laid back chill people and i was like that's cool because they seem real and they weren't so old that it just was unrealistic that these people could could deal with this situation because you know back in the day ma and pa kent were always portrayed as these like 75 year old uh, uh you know middle class uh like working people and it's like something like this happening to them would have given Pa Kent a fucking heart attack and maybe even Ma Kent a stroke or some shit. Whereas in this, they seem like maybe they're in their late uh, 50s, early 60s, something like that. I want to say late 50s. Um, at least Ma is in her 50s, Pa is in the 60s. And they seem like the same thing, working class people, but very grounded working class people who have some type of belief that there is more to you know to the world and to life than what we what we see which is why they could actually stomach having a kid just appear from space and you know they, they were like okay shit we need to hide this ship from the government because people are going to want it and they're going to try to do tests on this kid we have to protect him and we're going to teach him how to be a regular good person so it's more believable i guess is what i'm saying and when i say believable i just mean within the realms of suspension of belief sci-fi fantasy you feel like this is a logical, uh, these are logical reactions from people that could possibly be in a situation like this, or this is a logical direction for those characters. It doesn't feel far-fetched past the point of suspension of belief. Um, and that's a big thing about this film. It's, it's Superman. And, you know, a lot of people are bitching and moaning about all these, these stupid things that still fit within the realm of fantasy and they're still bitching and moaning and complaining and saying it should be like this and blah, 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 blah. Suspend your fucking belief. It's that simple. Suspend your fucking belief. It's suspension of belief. You're not supposed to believe that this is 100% real. It's just supposed to feel a little bit more feasible than it has in the past. You know, better effects, better quality uh, designs, better quality um, uh, uh, 
soundtrack. I won't even say better quality, but new, more up-to-date soundtrack. So, you know, after we get the little slice of Americana, we get this, uh, a scene of Clark uh, dealing with a man at a truck stop. Uh, kind of reminiscent of, uh, I want to say it was Superman 2 when he gave up his powers. But, uh, you kind of see him put in a situation where it's like, shit, you know, under regular circumstances, I would just m destroy this dude, or if I could, I would do it. You know, I would like to do it. But because he's who he is and he's been instilled, his parents instilled these, these, these really powerful values in him, he doesn't do anything to the guy. The guy is being a douche to uh, a girl he worked with, and uh, he tries to defend her, and uh, dude pretty much throws his beer in his face, pours it on his head, Soups uses his restraint, holds back, leaves. You see outside later on, dude's car has telephone, or his, his truck, I'm sorry, has telephone poles and logs and shit all stabbed through it from every angle, so this guy's not going anywhere. Anyway, the next scene you see is, uh, shortly after that they discover a spaceship in, uh, hidden in the ice out somewhere in like what the arctic i think it was and uh we're introduced to lois lane who is played by amy adams and she does an awesome job a lot of people said they didn't really feel her personally my favorite version of uh lois was the one from uh i don't not superman batman uh or i'm sorry not superman doomsday but uh what was the other one it was from uh the elite I liked her voice. Uh, she was done by, uh, man, the chick from uh, NCIS. I like that girl's voice. Uh, shoot, I used to watch NCIS just for that girl. You know, the goth chick, Abby. But uh, anyway, long story short, this version of Lois Lane is really straightforward, kick-ass, don't take no shit from no one. She feels like girls I dated in New York. She's just like, in your face, this is what I'm about. You either deal with it or, you know, move on because this is just the way it is. And that's pretty cool for her. You can kind of see why she has the kind of personality that would draw a small town Clark Kent to her. Because she's pretty strong, similar to his mom, which unfortunately is some trait that we all seem to have. Um, well, many of us do. She's strong, but at the same time, she can be, uh, you know, compassionate when she needs to be. Anyway, they find the ship. Inside the ship is Superman's gear, all kinds of record pods and shit, and you see that one of the pods is, is open, the others had, uh, you know, they were damaged, and you don't know where this is going. You're like, what the fuck? That's kind of kind of weird. And then you, you find a projection of uh, Jor-El, who explains to Cal-El who he is, where he comes from, and what the plot of this whole movie actually is. Um, well... He doesn't really explain all of the plot, but he does explain a good portion of it. He foreshadows a lot of the plot. Anyway, long story short, from this point, you're treated to finally seeing Superman. Um, uh, Henry Cavill puts on the suit. He becomes Superman. We're like, shit, this is what we've been waiting for. You see him jump. He actually starts leaping these ridiculous heights. And you're like, shit, this is awesome, you know? You're seeing him do... It's like nods to when... Superman did not fly because initially in the comics soups used to only jump ridiculous distances And that's where the phrase, you know able to leap tall buildings in a single bound comes from um, So he jumps a few times jumps a few times and then he starts to fly for a brief period Then he busts his ass into a mountain and then he thinks back to what his father had told him About you know the, the people could be a great people if they want to but if you give them time and you show them the way They will join you in the Sun and soups takes off flying and you're like shit this is awesome and it's probably the best flight that we've seen i mean they even pull off the video game perspective where uh it's kind of over the shoulder and you're seeing him dip through mountains and shit like that and it doesn't feel like a guy in front of a green screen uh which you know other movies and the later superman films have moments of that but uh it's really cool to see him use his powers you see him break the sound barrier it's all the cool shit you saw in the trailer Anyway, from this point, Zod shows up, and it's pretty much because of the activation of the uh, ship with his control key, 
you're now seeing that he let other aliens, which are the other Kryptonians, know where he was. So they, they home in on the signal, come down, and they give you this real eerie, you know, you are not alone message to draw out Cal. Cal shows up, they have their first talk, he gives himself up because he wants to let people know that you know he is on their side so he's not gonna hide and let Zod do you know whatever fucked up shit he's gonna do but he he has a feeling that Zod can't be trusted he's right him and Lois end up getting snatched up on board the ship all kinds of craziness happens Zod kind of reveals how crazy he is and uh Jor-El is, uh, the computer form of Jor-El is, is released to help him, uh, to help Lois show Clark how to stop Zod. So apparently this version of Jor-El, this projection is kind of programmed into the control of uh, the Kryptonian command key, which is the little key that is like a miniature version of the key, the ginormous key he used to use to open the Fortress of Solitude. Instead, they made it a small, almost magnetic key with the House of Jor-El symbol on, or House of L, I'm sorry, symbol on the back. And uh, it just flies into a little slot, you press it in, and then it activates things, and it gives you know, the, the, the wielder control over whatever Kryptonian device it is that it's connected to. Anyway, Jor-El's uh, you know, form shows up, explains to Lois that he can shut down certain things and blah, 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 but I need you to teach Kal-El how to do these things. So you're kind of getting more of a, a, of a tying of Lois to soups, and I like it. It made more sense. Um, and from there, you are treated to the best superhero action I have seen in a long time, probably since Avengers. And I'm not even going to hold back this the, 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 the last, <laughs> the final half of the, the second act and the whole third act blows away Avengers as far as how nuts that action is. There's no weird, overly animated kicks like what Cap did to <laughs> in that Marvel Ultimate Alliance moment that you had that was awesome, but it was kind of weird. There's no, uh, let's focus on the guy who was actually D-list, but because an actor that people kind of like became this character, we're going to kind of focus on him just because. No, you don't get that. There's none of that, like, Wolverine brings in the most money, so let's focus on Wolverine and shit on everybody else. Nah. You know, Michael Shannon's an awesome actor. He did an awesome job as Zod, but when the time came for these battles, they focus on the right people. Feora steals the show in battle because she's like Wesker from Resident Evil, just teleporting and teleporting. It looks like she's teleporting because she's moving so fast. And she's just hitting people, hitting soups with, with, with no disregard for the, the, the background, no disregard for people. She's killing people left, right, and center. She kills a bunch of soldiers. It's like the stakes are so high, or they're, they're raised here. So Soups realizes that he can't keep talking to people. He can't keep reasoning with people. Um, the, there's another Kryptonian, this huge one. I think his name is Namek, which is kind of funny. Um, but uh, he jumps up, punches a, um, a what is it, a, an A-10 or B, B-10. I can't remember what the, I think it's an A-10. Uh, punches the, the front piece rips the dude out just crushes him in his hands you see the blood fly off into the wind it's like holy shit these guys are not fucking playing um the battle of smallville is really cool and it's a nice little uh prelude to the battle of metropolis which is like it's just it, i was floored um and this is where everyone has their issues where they're talking about how uh there's so much collateral damage and superman wouldn't do that and you're right professional seasoned Superman wouldn't do this. You have to remember, this is essentially the first time uh, or second time that he put on his costume. The first time is the Battle of Smallville. The second time is the Battle of Metropolis. And uh, Zod reveals his plan. His plan is he is uh, he wants to terraform uh, Earth and turn it into a new Krypton. And they have these devices called world engines that allow them to terraform planets. And in the, the scene when Jarell explains everything to his son, he tells you that the Kryptonians had traveled the stars for thousands of years. And uh, 
they would uh, terraform the places they thought that were suitable until, and they would use up the resources until it just, you know, could no longer sustain them and then they'd move on. So you kind of get this little like, almost, I, I, I kind of want to not say it, but it felt like the Viltrumites from uh, Invincible, which if you've read Invincible is like a super violent parody of Superman in a sense, you know? But uh, it even felt like Saiyans to some degree because it's like, yeah, we're going to go here and we're going to do what we're going to do and we're going to move on and we're going to destroy shit in the process. So you kind of understood why soups couldn't hold back in these battles. Zod was a beast because after soups takes care of Feora and the other ones, uh, soups has to throw down with Zod. You kind of feel for Zod because they explain to you, Zod tells you, I was bred for the sole purpose of protecting my people and my planet's destroyed and my people are destroyed and uh soups actually destroys the uh the genesis matrix where the um or genesis chamber where uh it was housed on that ship that uh superman found and activated with his command key and uh soups decides to destroy it because he's like there's no way i'm gonna let you guys do what you're trying to do and Zod just loses his shit because essentially with no people and no planet, he has no purpose. And with no purpose, he has no sanity and he loses it. And uh, you see the most destruction I've seen on screen since, uh, you know, the last Roland Emmerich disaster film, you know, uh, it's it's amazing because you're actually seeing what happens when two people or multiple characters with these kind of powers clash. And this is what I've been wanting to see. This is what we've seen in Justice League Unlimited when he fought uh, Captain Marvel or Shazam, for those of you who don't know. Or when he fought Darkseid in, in the last, the final episode, Destroyer. Um, I mean, it was so much destruction because you're having characters of insanely uh, high power levels punch each other. I mean, it needs to be rippling air. You need to have craters in the ground. I mean, you need buildings to fall down. And yes, a lot of people died. But a lot of people also were evacuated by the military. Um, you get moments where uh, you have military trying to team up and fight, uh, you know, do their part to stop the world engines while Superman is actually fighting with the Kryptonians. And it's just quality. The world engine is smashing uh, Metropolis with gravity. <laughs> it's like these gravity blasts just pancaking the fuck out of... Uh, uh, metropolis and you're just like damn like if they succeed this is gonna be fucked up so soups is going all out to try and stop it people said the action scenes were too long it's just right for me it's epic it's new myth this is our mythology it's modern mythology since the comics are failing at doing this right in mo in many ways the film has to take take up for it and i think they did a fine job with it i'm not gonna say the movie's perfect but it's really close you know and if you appreciate what's going on which a lot of fans do if you appreciate seeing superheroics on screen uncompromising superheroics this film delivers um yeah it's hard to see superman kill which happens superman is finally got zod in in a lock like a headlock and zod uh during the course of their fight zod starts to uh his his helmet is cracked so his his reaction to our sun activates the special abilities that Kryptonians have when they come to Earth. So it takes him like a day to get used to it. During their final battle, he just breaks off his armor and he explains, you know, I'm a soldier, I was bred to do this, and I, I've trained to be in control of my body and whatnot. And you, where'd you train? On a farm? And I mean, essentially he did. But uh, you see Zod just shoot, pull off his armor and start flying around and using his be eye beams and it's ridiculous you're like wow he actually like figured it out real quick so zod and soups are in like a train station that looked really like a uh, grand central station in new york and he sees this family and he's like you know it's pretty much either them or me so he aims his beams at them soups turns his head just a little bit zod keeps turning his head towards them and it's this struggle and you know soups doesn't want to kill him because that's not his way but he doesn't have a choice because he doesn't want to see these people killed and he snaps zod's neck and it is fucking amazing
it's that moral choice that uh you know those, those super tough moral choices and moral decisions that kind of test your character's uh moral compass especially in superman's case because he's always had you know with the justice league they have that strict code we never kill and you've noticed that the times that they have killed it's because there was no other way to deal with this situation a lot of people are bitching about that they're like why would superman kill that's not fair he wouldn't kill anyone that's not my superman no 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 well you're right it's not your superman this is the new one and on top of it this is more like superboy they just made the age fit a little bit more you're watching like a maybe 30 something year old superman who put on the suit for the first time there, there are no there is no legion of superheroes and superboy time period where he got to practice for his uh, his young adulthood and get good and then become an adult and be perfect no he got thrown into it so he's making choices that are hard and after he snaps zod's neck and it's crazy because he snaps his neck so hard you see the air ripple around them and there's this loud thunderous crack and you're just like shit that dude is dead um he falls to his knees and starts screaming in pain because it was not what he wanted to do and it's a compromise of the strict moral value system or, or moral code that he's developed over you know the course of his life i mean he's been living his life f running around to different cities penniless and in some cases taking odd jobs protecting people from each other and shit that they couldn't have possibly protected themselves from and he doesn't want to hurt people and then here he is in a situation where it's only him and this guy left and uh he's stuck he has to do it um the other kryptonians i, I didn't mention before but just in case you guys you know you don't know what happens they find a way to use his old uh ship superman ship that one that brought him here as a child as a it has a uh, like a warp drive and they found a way to rig it so that it would act as a black hole generator and suck the world engine and the other kryptonians and all that shit back into a black hole and shoot them out somewhere else on the other end of the galaxy and they they succeed in that part barely but they do succeed so it leaves zod and cal as the only two kryptonians left and whoever it is that jumped out of the pod on the ship that will probably serve as Cal's Fortress of Solitude. Um, but uh, it's it's nuts because you, you got to see Superman make one of those decisions where it's like, you just have to do what you have to do. And he's not gonna let us die because he knows that's that was his purpose for coming here was to protect these people. So um, I don't have an issue with that at all, you know? That's one of the things that I've, I've thought about film versions of superheroes that makes sense is that a lot of times the film versions kill their villains because there is no other way and you're just going to deal with this shit over and over and over. Like Batman, I always said Batman should kill the Joker and I said this when I was a little kid watching the fucking Adam West Batman. I was reading some of the comics, the ones my mom would let me read at the time, and then uh, I was watching that show and I was like, why doesn't he just kill those guys? or blow up their base, or break their legs, or something so that they can't do it again. And when my brother and I would play with our toys, we would do that. We would make Batman, like, break, you know, the Riddler's legs, or, you know, bang his head so hard against something that he would have brain damage, and he couldn't think the way that he was thinking, you know? Like, Batman was malicious, because I was also watching Arnold movies, and Stallone movies, and Seagal movies, and there's there's kind of a logic to the way those heroes dispatch their enemies as opposed to wrapping them up all nice and pretty and bringing them to prison and saying hey or bring them to the police and saying hey put this guy in prison you know reform him that's not how it fucking works you know um so you know you guys out there in you know la la land have complained that you don't like superheroes you don't read comics because it's so fake it's so fantasy and now we have this age of realism of forced uh, uh, uh relative realism so it's real to certain people but it's not real in the grand scheme of things so you want realism here's your realism i mean i don't know why you would want realism in a fantasy sci-fi film about a guy who is it's pretty much jesus with with insane powers who came to protect us but you wanted realism here you go you can't have it both ways. 
and I think Snyder and company did a good job. I mean, you know Snyder had ideas because he is an artist. He draws a lot of these things out first, and uh, I respect that. You know he knows about superheroes because you see a lot of nods to superheroics in a lot of his films. Um, you know, Goyer's worked for DC and Marvel and, you know, he has a, 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 an idea of what all these characters are supposed to be like. And some of the ideas, it's just mostly, I'm not a fan of his writing when it's just him. So you know because Christopher Nolan was involved, there was a lot of filtering some of those ideas through a little bit more... Uh, a more uh, grounded filter or you know uh, how do I put this Guillermo del Toro called it sperm removal when he went through during Blade 2 he went through the script that Goya wrote and took out all the bullshit and made it make sense I think that's what happened here with uh, you know Christopher Nolan and Goya but what I'll give him is that you could tell all the super fantastical shit Goyer came up with and the more uh, grounded, you know, heartwarming or, uh, uh, you know, dramatic moments came from uh, Nolan. And it worked. It was a nice balance in that sense. People said the pacing was off. I don't know what you expect when a flashback shows up. That doesn't really kill pacing, you know? It's, it's a three-act movie with like a two acts uh, sub story you know told through flashbacks and you had a prologue get over it it's that simple um people just don't understand enough about film they don't understand enough about the written word they don't understand enough about comics and fantasy and mythology to appreciate all of the things that this film is trying to do and i'm not saying everything it does is a, a billion percent successful there are some things that i'm like really like the amount of times that you see um clark in a situation where he has to hide his powers we know that we know he's done it a lot um the amount of times that uh they show you these little vignettes between him and pa kent and that was one of the things i, I wanted to save it for last a lot of people have an issue with Pa Kent. Either you, you, you love him or you hate him. The Pa Kent that we all read about in the comics and even in the movies I think he had a heart attack and he dies. So you know it's one of those things where it's just the way it is. This is life. This is how it works. Soups can't do anything. In this movie he martyrs himself. He, a tornado is coming. People are trying to get away. A dog is stuck in the car. He tells Clark take your mom. I'll get the dog. And then he gets the dog out but then he, uh, one of, a car flies up, crushes the car that he's in, and his leg gets stuck. So he's trying to get out, trying to get out, trying to get out. He finally gets out, and he looks at Clark, and Clark is like, you know, pretty much I can come and save you. And he tells Clark, nah, don't, don't come. Just let what's going to happen happen. So Clark literally has to watch his dad get snatched up in a fucking tornado and get killed. And it kind of, it, it does help you understand that all these people believe in him so much that he can't afford to fail, which adds to his, uh, his determination to be the sign and the symbol and be the, 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 this hero that the world needs without a doubt. Um, I think they did an awesome job putting that in there. Um, Agent O, he didn't dig it that much. He said it made it too similar to Spider-Man. But, you know, Uncle Ben didn't sacrifice himself. Uncle Ben was mugged. So there's a difference, in my opinion. But him and I didn't agree on that part. But I said, you know, I could see how it could bother some people. But besides that, you have a solid film. There's really not that much to complain about, you know? So, uh, all in all, this movie is a treat. It's a visual feast for your fucking eyes. I don't understand how anyone could watch this movie and have a shitload of complaints when the movie was so well done. Um, the costume design is awesome. The casting is awesome. The uh, CGI is awesome. Um, every single power that they have, especially the heat vision, looks awesome. Um, little little details, you know, like his, there's a luminescence in Superman's head around the eyes like it looks like if you could shine a flashlight through his mouth up through the top of his head and his eyes were supposed to be the spot to give off all the light you can see his skin light up and you can see veins and 
you know, all kinds of shit. And, and it's quality because you're like, damn, and then there's like mist and heat around his face. You see the, the distortion from the heat waves and it's quality. It's, it's easily the best version of heat vision that you've seen him use ever. Um, even his x-ray vision, it was startling because you got to see like different layers of things. And this is another thing they got from Justice League Unlimited. Whenever Superman uses heat vision, it was always like, here's one overlay, here's another overlay, here's another overlay. And they did that perfectly in this film. Um, the, a lot of the fighting, the combat was so fucking good. I mean, Supes and Feora and even Zod, they were trapping, they were fighting from multiple zones, and it was really quick because they only punch and kick a couple times and then someone goes flying and then they ram each other but you were seeing every kind of epic kind of fighting that you could do i mean it wasn't martial all this martial arts but there was some basis for what you would do in close quarters and it was nice to see that as opposed to superman grabbing somebody by the legs and giant swinging and tossing somebody into something that wasn't all he did you know it felt like really well choreographed wwe you know um it just, the music, whew. I was afraid that the music was gonna try too hard to imitate John Williams' score. But what it does is it's a, it, it, the theme, the main theme, Soup's theme, is this building theme that builds from very ambient uh, notes to this like powerful, driving, heroic uh, uh, set of drums and then horns that just build up and make you want to jump up and start flying around the theater yourself. It's just, I don't know, Hans Zimmer actually did something this time. I usually complain about Hans Zimmer because he's that go-to guy that just makes the generic themes for everything. But he did a good job, him and uh, James Horner with uh, The Dark Knight and you know Batman Begins and all that. Um, and they did a really good job here. If this continues, I can only imagine Justice League being so epic, people are gonna just bust in their pants in the theater. So I'm, I'm looking forward to whatever comes next. I just hope that Snyder and company understand that we don't wanna see another land stealing scheme from Lex. Um, speaking of Lex, did you see all the nods to Lex in uh, to LexCorp? You had a LexCorp logo on a, um, on a uh, tanker, an oil tanker, and you had a, a LexCorp uh, uh, logo on the building when the things were falling, the pieces of uh, whatever were falling from space. I was like, oh shit, that's pretty cool. Um, and it was like Wayne Industries on a freaking satellite in space. I was like, oh shit, okay. Um, it's kind of cool that they put those things in there because this is the little things they need to do to tie the world together. I just hope that they do it in a more organic way throughout all these DC films and they don't try so hard to just imitate what Marvel was doing because, you know, DC's been around for a long time and these characters, not like almost all of them have been around longer than the Avengers. The Avengers came out in the 60s. Freaking all these characters were like World War II. So like, you do the math. World War One and Two, because I think the, yeah the, the the JSA is old, so it'll be nice to see what they do with this, and this is a good starting point for what will become the DC Cinematic Universe. Now, what I would like to see is a sequel that has a, a cameo, like a, a scene, a team up scene with someone else, you know, um, some other character. It could be Batman, which would be huge. Um, it could be Wonder Woman, which would be even more huge in my opinion, because then they could do a version of her and then build off of it. Um, because she needs a, a, a film version that's, that's as, as capable as her animation version, because Wonder Woman in animation is an unstoppable beast, but Wonder Woman on film is a joke. So, you know, I want to see them do this right. Um, but, you know, long story short, and this has been a really long story, I wanted to make sure I cover as much of it as possible. The movie is well done. The, the, the action is not too much. It's, it's what you waited 30 years to see this, you know? I don't even count Superman Returns. That was a big misstep. It was a, a non-entity. It was a cinematic abortion. They shouldn't have even bothered with that shit because anyone could have read that script and said, oh, so you like Richard Donner's films. But we already have Richard Donner's film. So, uh, no, Mr. Singer, peace outside. You can't fuck this franchise up just like you did with X-Men. Because in my opinion, those X-Men movies are fucking horrible. And everyone gives them so much props, but I don't think they deserve them. But this is the action that 
was lacking since Superman 2. And we finally got it. Whether or not you like it, I mean, that's up to you. To me, it, it, this, it did it for me. It, it did it for me. It's what I was waiting to see. Especially after watching Avengers and all the other Marvel films, this eclipses all of them in the realm of action. So go and see it. It's a very decent story. Um, you already know it. The story is as old as... It's been around forever. You know it already. So it's not too much that needs to be explained to you. The movie ends with Clark explaining to his mom that he's going to get a job somewhere where he can be aware of what's going on and have his ear to the ground. And you see him show up at the Daily Planet in regular clothes and glasses. And he's right there <laughs> introduced to Lois Lane. And she just plays it off like, oh, hey, I know you. How you doing? Shakes his hand. Movie ends. You're like, shit. Just imagine what's coming next. You know? Anyway. I am Strident. This has been my long ass review for Man of Steel. And uh, this is my story. And I am fucking sticking to it. And I will see you on the next review. Peace outside.